and in this video of EFI Explained, we're going to talk about these, the coolant temperature sensor. What we're going to cover is what they are, how they work, what relevance they have to EFI, how to test them, what to watch out for when using them, and some further in-depth technical electronic fuel injection information regarding these actual sensors. So first of all, what are they? Well, this is a Bosch two-pin type, mini-timer type engine coolant temperature sensor. And this is the sensor that would be used in conjunction with the engine management system, not the dashboard gauges example, because they usually have one wire connection on them and they err through the chassis of the sensor, whereas this one actually goes through two pins on top of the sensor. Standard mini timer type two pin connector and the other types of sensors, for example this Ford one, has a style of connector like what we would call a Denso type connector and wouldn't be compatible with any engine management system that uses these type of sensors and that is because of the way they work. Now these sensors are a negative temperature coefficient sensor which means its resistance decreases as the temperature increases and each type of these sensors has their own particular calibration curve and if we go ahead and draw a curve of one of these sensors they will look something like this. Given a temperature which increases and a resistance in ohms, which increases that way, the resistance falls as the temperature increases. And this curve is specified for each type of sensor. Now, these Bosch sensors, and indeed the Bosch air temp sensors, all follow a similar sort of curve, and so most general engine management systems and aftermarket management systems all come normally set up for these Bosch sensors. Of course, you can calibrate in these curves into, into your engine management systems or any engine management system that we're going to be tuning with. So, one thing to note as well is the curve is not a straight line curve, it's a logarithmic curve, which means the sensitivity is reduced as the temperature increases. And that's something we'll talk about later on when we discuss the further technical information about these sensors. So, what is the use of these sensors with relation to electronic fuel injection? Well, the first thing is back in the day of carburetors, most people would have to pull out a choke when it's first starting the car. And the reason for that is that when an engine is cold, the petrol doesn't atomize very well. So what you need is you need a bit more fuel in there to get a good combustion, to get a good burn from the engine itself. So the ECU of the engine management system is looking at the temperature reported by this sensor. And if the engine is cold, it's going to put in slightly more fuel, a multiplier of the fuel table, so some additional fuel. And it's also used during cranking and starting, so that the engine, know, the engine management system knows that the engine is cold when cranking, or it's hot when cranking. So again, it can put in the right amount of fuel to get the engine running properly. Now, the, throughout the 90s and the early 2000s, these sensors were usually independent for the engine management system. The dashboard gauges and the cooling fans would usually have additional sensors to control those different areas of the cars. But lately, uh, more modern systems, what they tend to do is just have the one sensor in the cooling system, and that would then send off signals for the ECU to trigger the cooling fan, and also, perhaps over CAN bus, indicate for the driver the temperature of the engine on the dashboard. And again, there's some things to look out for when wiring these into cars, which we'll go through shortly. So how to test these sensors? Well, being a thermistor and a simply a resistor, we can measure its resistance across these two pins, checking against the, the calibration curve or the data sheet for the sensor to make sure it's reading correctly. And we'll do a short video on that and how to test them, which we'll link to below. So, what to watch out for in terms of using engine management systems and these sensors? Well, as I've previously said, Every sensor has a different type of curve, depending on their part number, although Bosch type sensors are usually very similar. Ford sensors, again, completely different, as are most Japanese sensors. So when using an engine management system or changing a coolant temperature sensor, it's important to get the one that's matched for the ECU you're using, or use an ECU which has a programmable table, such as R Systems or Motec or Emerald or Omex or any of these higher level systems, which you can actually calibrate in the curve of these sensors. So what to watch out for with these sensors? Well, if you're looking at fitting aftermarket management to a more modern car, it's probably going to be using this sensor to drive the dashboard. And it won't be driving the dashboard directly, it will more than likely be driving it through the original factory ECU on the car, translating that to CAN bus and then displaying that to the driver. So it's all well and good to assume that you could tap into this sensor line for your ECU. Well, that's not going to be possible. And the reason for this is on how the actual ECU system uses these sensors to, to monitor the engine coolant temperature. The way it works is you have the ECU, and what the ECU does is it outputs a voltage 
which goes through the thermistor or the coolant sensor, which looks like that, to ground. Now sometimes that ground will come back to the ECU through a sensory ground or sometimes it will just go to a common ground on the car. But the problem is, if you T-piece into this with your aftermarket engine management system, so up at aftermarket ECU, and you come in like this with your coolant sensor line, what happens is the resistance within this system here can affect the reading of the coolant temperature sensor. And not only that, more modern ECUs, due to the way the curve is logarithmic, will sometimes switch in an extra bias resistor to get more accurate readings as the engine temperature increases. Again, most engine management systems won't support that. So it's very important if you want to retain the standard dashboard when fitting engine management systems, you even ensure you have a dashboard that has an independent coolant temperature sensor, or you fit another engine coolant temperature sensor specifically for your ECU. Another thing to note as well is if removing the factory ECU and fitting one of these coolant sensors, the cooling fan may have been driven by the original ECU, in which case you will need to install a relay and use a programmable output on your aftermarket management to drive the fan at a specified temperature. Otherwise the engine could overheat and it might not be something that shows up immediately under testing, so it's something to watch out for. So let's go through how these coolant temperature sensors are used with an ECU in terms of mapping. We've already said how on a traditional car with a carburetor you'd use a manual choke, uh, which would enrich the mixture and therefore let the engine run better. So let's go through exactly what these do in terms of a modern ECU or an aftermarket ECU and the various tables that they're used within, within these ECUs. So the first table would be the warm-up enrichment table. And this table typically looks like this. Okay, what we can see here is this is the temperature that this sensor is reporting in degrees centigrade, and this is the enrichment percentage of the fueling. So it would look up its base fueling from the main table, which might say 5 milliseconds or 7 milliseconds, and then it would check this table to see how much enrichment it wants to add to the fuel dependent on this temperature sensor. So the curve might typically look like this. And as you can see, when the engine reaches its nominal temperature of around 90 degrees centigrade, it then puts in 100% of the normal fuel, so it puts in just what the fuel might be saying. There's no other correction applied related to this engine management sensor. Also, another setting that will be there will be a scalar setting, which will be the temperature at which the fan should come on and which the fan should turn off. Um, and there will be another factor for this sensor, which would be the starting and cranking, which again would look similar to this, but might relate to a pulse width to apply when cranking the engine below a certain RPM, uh, as to how much to inject to get the engine to start properly. There will also be an after-start enrichment, which will be a very short time of enriched fuel, again relating to this coolant temperature sensor. And for example, in a hot starter condition, like switching the engine off and then momentarily back on, very unlikely this sensor will cause much difference to the engine. So it's a third tier sensor. It's not a priority sensor, it's more of a help the engine run properly sensor. One thing to note is that this is a coolant temperature sensor because it has the enclosed sensor element inside of there. If we compare it to an air temperature sensor, you can see how the element is exposed. And this is because the coolant temperature sensor doesn't need to react very fast to changing, changing statuses because the coolant itself takes a while to, to change in temperature, whereas the air temperature can fluctuate quite rapidly, especially on turbocharged cars. And so the element or the thermistor is actually exposed so that it can have a faster reaction time. And that's all for this video on coolant temperature sensors. To check out more sensors and more videos and more technical guides and what else we plan on covering on the MTech Zone, be sure to subscribe with the link below. And we'll see you next time.